I don't, uh, let, let me start without, while we're waiting, let me start talking about protein structures, okay? I don't need to have the slides to talk about protein structures. <laughs> I, can, I can start talking about protein structures and uh, I hope the computer is going to catch up with us. Okay, so uh, yesterday I told you that protein structures uh, that we are going to be dealing are, uh, with are, they are three-dimensional shapes. So, and uh, uh, in a PDB file, which is the de facto standard for protein structure information, uh, which you can download from the protein data bank. So there's a database called protein data bank, which, is, uh, which stores uh, structural information about proteins, uh, about proteins whose structures are determined experimentally. And there are basically two, two, two ways, uh, two, two different experimental techniques to determine a protein structure. The first one is called X-ray crystallography, okay, X-ray crystallography, and the other is NMR, uh, nucleic magnetic uh, resonance. Uh, there are basic different, there are main, uh, the structures that are determined by these two techniques are different. Uh, in other words, uh, the main difference is that NMR cannot, the, the, these are experimental techniques and they're very costly. Uh, for example, there are NMR machines, uh, they may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars based on the resolution that they are going to provide you or based on the different constraints that they are going to provide you. Uh, and X-ray crystallography, uh, the technique, uh, in order to be able to use the technique, you need to crystallize your protein. So the protein is not going to be in its native environment. You need to extract the protein uh, to find its shape. You need you crystallize it, and usually proteins uh, are not uh, do not have static shapes. They have by, by interacting with other compounds, for example, they may go small conformational changes. Small shape changes may be observed on proteins. However, X-ray crystallography ignores these uh, variation. And it just freezes the protein structure. It crystallizes it and tries to find the shape of the uh, protein structure in its crystal form. And the, the technique is very difficult. Sometimes it may take a year uh, to find, or more than a year, to find the shape of a single protein. So it's very costly. Um, and it's difficult to crystallize proteins. Um, for example, membrane proteins are very difficult to crystallize. Therefore, if you go to protein data bank, there are only uh, like eight or 10 uh, structures for membrane proteins. The reason is that membrane proteins are not soluble. I mean, they, they, they live within a lipid environment. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to, if, if they get out of their original environment, it will be difficult. They're not going to continue to stay in the same shape in their original, uh, uh, in their original shape. They are going to have, uh, I mean, they are going to have different shapes and which, which is going to give you an incorrect result if you perform this X-ray crystallography. So it's very difficult to uh, use these experimental techniques. They are very costly and that's the main reason we do not have the protein structures for all millions of proteins, protein sequences. We know a lot of protein sequences. Seven, 10 million protein sequences are in, in the Uniprot database. If you go search for protein sequences, you are going to get yourself millions of them. However, if you go to protein data bank, only there are tens of thousands. So we are uh, like uh, 1,000 uh, times less uh, I mean, only one, th one in a th 10 thousand of protein sequences have known structures. So we, we still have a lot, of way, uh, we, uh, to, a lot of way to go in order to uh, know these protein structures. So, and why is it important to know protein structure? Why do we need to know the structure of a protein? Because it tells us a lot of things about its function. By just looking at the sequence, maybe what we can do is we can search for conserved domains. If we can, if certain domains which have its known function, for example, potassium binding domain or sodium uh, potassium binding domain, that, that domain may have a certain sequence pattern that you may recognize, a certain signature. If you have, if you're looking at a protein sequence, you can look for these signatures 
to infer to get to know something uh, to infer something about its function, but uh, if you these patterns may be very variable and some if you, if you are in your protein may have null functions that you cannot uh, I mean it can it may not contain any of the known domains known patterns in that case the finding inferring the function of the protein is going to be very difficult by just looking at the sequence uh, and structure tell if we know the structure of the protein it's going to tell us a lot more about this protein for example if you are going to design a drug you can by looking at the structure you can find out where this drug is going to bind in the structure to disrupt its function, for example. To, to, this, uh, to, to inactivate this protein, how do we design a drug? Uh, drugs are basically small molecules that interact with protein, proteins. When they, when they interact with those proteins, they just uh, shut down its function. So how, in order to be able to design drugs, we need to know their shape. Because when we are designing a drug, the, the interaction, this physical interaction between a drug and its target protein is, uh, is done at the physical uh, three-dimensional environment. So we need to know their shapes. Uh, knowing structure is really, really important. And if, we don't, if you do not know the structure of a protein, uh, what we can do is, uh, many, many people, many researchers, if the structure of the protein they're interested in is not in the protein data bank, what they do is they use computational techniques, web servers, there are, there are servers uh, or tools, uh, downloadable applications, which uh, computationally predicts, given a sequence, we can predict what the structure is going to look like. Uh, the bad thing about this is our prediction is not going to be 100% accurate. And for certain proteins, uh, and this prediction accuracy uh, is variable. For certain type of proteins, this tool may produce very good results. But for, so, for certain type of proteins, the tool produces very bad results. The accuracy may range from 40% match to 99% 99 match. Uh, but in, we do not know um, b beforehand whether the tool is going to provide good results or not. So we really cannot tr uh, trust fully the computationally predicted structure. Uh, therefore, it just gives some kind of clues. The computationally predicted structure is going to give us some clues about the actual structure. Uh, we may conduct, we may use multiple tools to overcome this uh, trust issue, what we can do is we can use multiple tools. We can submit our sequence to multiple tools and see how these structure look like and maybe get the common parts of these structures as true, true parts, true, true shapes. Uh, or we may wait until the experimental techniques <laughs> gives us the real structure. Uh, this is a really big important problem uh, in this uh, in, in bioinformatics and there is a competition actually which is called uh, uh, CASP okay this CASP algorithm critical assessment of structure prediction algorithms I guess it's held in every two years and the goal is I mean in this competition uh, programs, tools uh, compete with each other uh, to predict the structure of given sequences. So uh, the organizers of this competition uh, take protein sequences with recently sold structures using experimental techniques but not yet made public to the world. So the, an X-ray for example given a, sequ a new sequence has been uh, solved by um, the structure, its structure has been found by using one of these techniques but they, it's, they, the researchers keep it secret and they give their sequence and structure to the organizers so organizers know the exact structure and they have a bunch of sequences like this and at the time of the competition runs like a couple of months they um, tell the sequences to the competitors, oh, and actually these sequences are available on the web, so anybody, everybody can see these sequences. And they run uh, their programs on these sequences and they, find, they come up with uh, predicted structures and they compare the predicted structure with the actual structure to see how well the programs did and uh, how accurate they were in 
finding the structure of these proteins. So it's, it's a very uh, uh, popular competition. Lots of uh, tools uh, compete in it. And there are fully automated part and there are sometimes manual intervention is allowed for a certain part of the competition. And there are different tasks. One task is just finding the three-dimensional structure. Another task is to find uh, the secondary structures in these uh, protein sequences. I'm going to talk about what the secondary structure is. So a protein structure has a certain level of structural information. The first, what, what we call primary structure, the sequence, the protein sequence, the amino acid, a linear amino acid sequence, is also called the primary structure. Okay, that's the, that's the linear backbone with no shape. That's the primary structure. The, the overall three-dimensional shape is actually composed of uh, smaller parts in a hierarchy, the actual three-dimensional shape. Uh, so we have the amino acids at, at the first level. Okay. So I'm going to have the uh, amino, uh, amino acids uh, at the first level. This is my primary uh, structure. And some of these amino acids, for example, this region is going to form a local shape. Uh, regardless of its three-dimensional, uh, final three-dimensional shape, a certain uh, local region, a subsequence in this whole sequence, may, for example, form a helical shape like this. And another part may form a straight shape. And the another subsequence here may also form a straight shape. And these straight shapes may actually come near each other in when, when the protein falls in three-dimensional space. So how does it happen? These are far away from each other in sequence. But when, they, when the protein falls, what happens is that this region just uh, fall, I mean, it's going to turn on itself. And th these sub th this subsequence can come here. And these two straight uh, local shapes may interact with each other in when, the, when the protein becomes uh, three-dimensional. Okay, this, this linear sequence of amino acids does not stand uh, as linear. It's going to, I wish I had some kind of co chords here that I can show you. So if this is my, let me check here. Uh, no, I should bring some toys with me <laughs> uh, to uh, talk about uh, protein structures. So if this is your first linear shape, maybe I can get one of these. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, I found one. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is my primary uh, structure, okay? This is the linear sequence of amino acids I have. Now, uh, it has a certain order, okay? The sequence of amino acids starts from a certain uh, direction and it goes until the, it's called from N terminus to C terminus. So there is an uh, unbound a nitrogen in this end and unbound carbon at this end. They are called N terminus and C terminus. So it's going from uh, left to right for you. And what happens is that this primary structure, when the um, messenger RNA is translated into the sequence of amino acids by the ribosome, what happens is first local structures start to form. For example, this middle region may look like a helix like this, okay? It becomes a helix, the middle region. And the other parts, for example, here, there may be a turn in the middle, and that turn may come, may help this end of this sequence, may come close to the beginning of this sequence in 3D space, okay? In the, linearly, they were very far away. If you look at the sequences, they were far away. It's, it's one end, this is the other end. But during the folding process, they may be neighbors. In three dimensions, these two uh, regions may be interacting, and the local shape, shape that they form may be just a uh, very straight shape. There are going to be lots of turns, helices, and other, I mean, this is going to fold on itself, and at the end, what we are going to get ourselves is going to be a 3D shape like this, okay? It may be, it's going to have a volume, it's going to have a 3D shape. And so sequence parts that were far away uh, in the primary structure may get close to each other 
in the 3D space. Now, these, uh, the secondary structure is about these local shapes. For example, a local region here is going to be straight. Another local region here is going to be straight. We are going to have a turn here, a band like this. We are going to have a helix here. Okay, the secondary structure still does not tell us anything about the overall 3D shape. It just tells us certain subsequences are going to have these local shapes. This part is going to be helix. This part is going to be turn. Uh, I don't know which angle the turn is going to be, but it's going to be a turn. It's, this part is going to stay straight. So these are the uh, local shapes that, uh, we are that, are, that, that we observe in the primary structure. These local shapes are called secondary structures. Okay, so the, and predicting the secondary structure from sequence is also challenging. So given these amino acids, which subsequence is going to stay straight? which part is going to be uh, fold up, uh, form this local shape called helix, which part is going to be uh, turned like this. So identifying this from sequence is you, even this more uh, simpler problem than three dimensional. This, this is still a one dimensional information. Just which subsequences are going to be uh, what? Okay, this is called secondary structure prediction uh, problem from a given sequence, finding which subsequences, which regions in this uh, protein sequence are going to form what type of local shapes. And there are mainly two main local shapes in protein structures, helices and these straight regions which are called uh, beta strands, okay, strands and sheets. The, the strands, they cannot, uh, a helix like this, can function on its own. However, these straight regions, they need uh, interacting partners. They need other strand sheets that to come close to each other and form bonds in between them to remain straight. They form beta sheets. Uh, these are, uh, individual of these are called uh, strands, beta strands. When they come together in three-dimensional space, uh, hydrogen bonds occur between these straight segments and they form beta sheets. They can be, uh, there can be two strands in a sheet and there can be five, six, ten. I mean, they can stack up like the, these straight uh, segments, uh, may, maybe like five to ten straight segments come together to form a beta sheet. So in the beta sheet we can have multiple straight segments. So that's the secondary structure and the the actual 3D shape of a protein uh, amino acid chain like this, the actual 3D shape in 3D space, is called the tertiary structure. So it's primary, secondary, tertiary. The tertiary structure tells us which, uh, which of these parts, are in the, it tells us the actual 3D shape. So I'm going to uh, talk about these with, uh, on the slides now. I'm going to quickly go over uh, what I have already talked about. Okay, so I told you that uh, protein structure is important to determine function. So the main uh, thing that determines the function of a protein is its, uh, is its structure. Uh, so if we know the knowing the structure of, of a protein is an important step towards identifying its uh, function. And this was last year uh, in April 10. Uh, the ex I mean, approximately a year ago, there were this many, about 40,000 protein structures. This is the address, address for protein data bank. Uh, this protein data bank is the um, source if you want to download, if you want to get real protein structure data, this is where you should go. And they're freely available. You can download them. Uh, uh, I mean, five, five, five years ago, I mean, the only format that was, um, the main format that was used was a PDB format, which was really unstructured. It just had certain headers, certain uh, headers at each line determines uh, what type of information that line in that file provides. And there were no standards. Uh, some uh, information could be missing in that P PDB file. For example, the secondary structure information, which subsequence is going to form which local structure, is actually the PDB file is capable of 
providing that information. There is this secondary structure part that provide, this tells you, okay, this sequence is this secondary structure, this sequence is this secondary structure. But the, the, the bad thing is not all PDB files have to have this information. So they may omit. If you, you may download a PDB file hoping to find a structure, it's going to contain secondary structural information, but you may be uh, upset if you, I mean, don't, don't get surprised if it doesn't contain uh, the secondary structure information. So what does a PDB file contain? At the minimum, the PDB file is going to contain the XYZ coordinates, three-dimensional coordinates uh, of the alpha carbon atoms of a protein structure. So it means that uh, there are actually many different atoms. Uh, I mean, each, each of these amino acids is composed of t tens of atoms. Okay, it's composed, this linear chain is composed of amino acids and each amino acid is, co is composed of a number of atoms and the PDB file, a, a complete structure should tell me the XYZ coordinates, three dimensional coordinates of all the atoms uh, that makes up this protein. However, uh, based on the experimentation that you use, you may not get a very high resolution data High resolution coordinates may not be found and some PDB files may contain only some uh, the coordinates of certain a critical atom, a central atom in this uh, chain which is called the alpha carbon. At each amino acid, each amino acid uh, has this uh, common part, uh, I'm going to also talk about the chemistry of amino acids quickly, but each amino acid have a common part and this common part has a central atom which is called the alpha carbon and uh, this structure may contain the coordinates of just that alpha carbon atom. And some tools actually, although uh, PDB files may contain more atoms, um, some of them contain all atoms, even hydrogen atoms, uh, some tools, because of this fact that not all PDB files contain all atoms, some tools, they just, for appro they just approximate the protein structure using just the uh, coordinates of alpha carbon atoms. Uh, there are lots of tools like that which ignores uh, the information, most of the information contained in PDB uh, file. It ju they just uh, get, and the, the just the, even the, just the coordinates of these single atoms for each residue, you get a, for each amino acid you are going to have a single point, a single coordinate. Uh, you, for example, if this uh, is a protein of 300 amino acids, you are going to have 300 points, 300 uh, three-dimensional uh, coordinates that represent this protein structure. And you can plot this uh, as a, a point cloud, uh, a three-dimensional point cloud. Uh, so PDB is growing rapidly. So let's look at how many uh, protein structures PDB contains today. RCSB.org. PDB. Okay, so as of three days ago, April 26, there are 72,000 structures. So it's growing uh, very rapidly. Uh, I mean, it's like plus 20,000 structures like 10 years ago. So not, not that rapid. <laughs> so 72,000 is uh, like uh, we have, if, if you have like 7 million protein sequences, non-protein non sequences, it's like only 1% of all protein sequences have known structures. Only 1% of them. I mean, there are 100 times more sequences that we know. And we know of 7 to 2,000 uh, protein structures, but there are 7 million protein sequences. So 99% of the protein sequences do not have known structures. Okay, we just have their amino acid information, and we don't know anything about their three-dimensional shape. Um, it's not co truly correct to say we don't know anything about, because by using computational tools, we may have some idea about their uh, structures. Now, uh, so this is the website, just want to show you a real, so usually this featured molecules, there's molecule of the month or protein of the month uh, uh, is featured here. As you can see, this, this is a, how a protein looks like. 
This is a cartoon representation. Like it's, uh, again, it's actually computer generated, but it looks like hand drawn. Okay. Uh, and uh, what you see here is that uh, this, is, this protein is actually uh, is composed of two amino acid chains. And these two different colors, so I talked about primary structure, secondary structure, and tertiary structure. Tertiary structure was the three dimensional shape of a amino acid chain. There is also the fourth level, which is called the quaternary structure. And this co sometimes uh, proteins, a single amino acid chain from beginning to end, uh, when it falls onto itself, may not be functional by just itself. Okay? An example to this is the hemoglobin, okay? the, uh, the protein that is responsible, uh, the, the, mo the molecular complex which is responsible for carrying, o carrying oxygen. The hemoglobin is composed of, what, what happens is that the single chain comes together, falls onto itself, forms a certain shape. It needs some other partners to enter uh, an, another protein chain, another different protein chain also falls uh, into a three-dimensional shape and physically interacts with this and forms a larger molecule. Only after that, that becomes a protein that is functional. Hemoglobin is composed of four such, uh, uh, four such chains uh, and actually uh, it contains a pairs of identical chains. There is uh, alpha and beta uh, chains, alpha and beta chains. Two alpha chains uh, form identical shapes, two beta chains form two identical shapes. They, four of them, they come together, uh, physically interact with each other, and they form the quaternary structure uh, of that uh, molecule. So they, can, they interact in a certain way. For example, this, in this, this, is, this quaternary structure shows us two separate amino acid chains. This blue and red indicate two different chains. Uh, it's also called, uh, so, uh, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, I, I'm also, also sometimes I'm, I make mistakes in these biological terms, but if I'm not wrong, it's also called a dimer, okay? It's, uh, because there are di, it's Latin for two, so the two chains come together, interact with it, they form a dimer, and this dimer is formed in a certain way. I mean, this, this blue uh, chain does not interact with this part. It interacts with this part. There's this interaction can only happen in a certain way. And finding out how they interact is also another research uh, area. I mean, if I, have, if I know the protein, uh, if I know the shapes of individual chains, uh, can you predict whether you put them together, they're going to form a larger uh, molecular complex by physically interacting with them? If they interact, which amino acids are going to take role in this interaction? So what is the interface of this interaction? Which amino acids uh, uh, take roles in this interaction between these two chains? So let's look at, uh, for example, this, this structure. You, you just see an image of it. Uh, let, I'm going to show you, uh, it can actually, okay, so these are different other, other uh, proteins from the same family, I guess, or these are called nanobodies, I don't know. Yeah, this was our molecular, molecule of the month, and this is, the same structure, okay, or, or I think this is, this is, this is like four, but, the, but this is another visual representation of a protein structure. As you can see, it looks quite different. The other one was the hand drawn and it, had, it's, uh, it, had, uh, it contains certain volume. This looks like a, uh, like a wire folded, okay? This, uh, pro this is probably showing just the backbone of the protein structure as a, a sequence of line segments. Okay, you can visualize the same protein structure as a sequence of line segments. You can also visualize the same protein structure. I think this is, this, this is a Java applet. Yeah, interacting JMOL. Yeah. So we have a J Java applet here, uh, which is going to uh, help us visualize the structure. 
So it is still running. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is that one, okay? The, the two chain, uh, that image we have seen. Uh, so this molecule of the month, look at this image. This image is the image of, I'm oh, sorry, this protein this one okay it's taken from a certain angle certain view okay this is how we uh, visualize it 3d uh, here it shows the interface we can see the interface more clearly how these two chains interact with each other uh, with these uh, inter these amino acids probably are in physical contact with the amino acids uh, in the surrounding region this is how the interface is formed and here the and we can see certain straight segments, the beta sheets, and we can also see helical structures. These are, you can see, for example, uh, let me try to show you. Yeah, this is an helix here. We see from one end, okay, it goes like this. You see, this is, this is your helix. Uh, and these are your straight shapes which uh, interact with each other. So this is only one way, uh, this, 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 this backbone visualization, you viewing it as like a wire folded on itself, is one way to visualize. Let me see if there are other options that we can use. Render menu, okay. Hmm. Color surface. Yeah, let's do this. Oh, it's isosurface, okay. Let's look at other oh, we yeah, it's probably here. No. Show selection. Render scheme. Yeah. Yeah, now I'm going to Yeah, this is the same protein. But it looks quite different than the previous one, right? If you just view the atoms in this protein, it's just a collection of atoms, collection of spheres. This is the uh, Van der Waals uh, representation by each at atomic coordinate. They have different individual uh, x, y, z coordinates. If you just plot these x, y, z, if you just, and also you, you they, they also, different atom types have different Van der Waals radii. Uh, they have different re radius. Uh, so, you uh, view it uh, in different radius, and this is what you get. And this is another one. Where did I get this from? Uh, render menu, right? It was, yeah, render scheme. This is balls and sticks. <laughs> Just uh, use smaller spheres for the atoms, to, and the, the, the balls are the atoms, the sticks are the, uh, uh, in, yeah, the, the, uh, and the, uh, the sticks shows which atoms uh, bind each other, okay? They show the binding uh, between atoms. They show the bonds. Bond, bonds are uh, sticks and balls are atoms here. As you can see, this, this is still the same uh, protein. And in this representation, we, do not, we cannot see individual chains. It still contains the blue and red part. Okay, but they are shown in the same color. The col coloring scheme is also determines how you vision. There are two chains, two separate chains here interacting in this, uh, in somewhere. And let me see if we have others. Render scheme sticks. We can just, on this sticks just shows the bonds, bonds between atoms, no, no spheres. And And wireframe cartoons only. This is and this one the biologists prefer most. Uh, shows the uh, secondary structures explicitly in different colors. Now, the, in the previous balls and sticks model, I mean, it was impossible to de deter detect hel helices, right? They were all, I mean, they every, 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 everywhere looked like helix, or it was really crowded. But in this cartoon representation, 
This is the same protein structure, okay? Nothing is different. Same XYZ coordinates. The PDB file that we process is exactly the same, okay? We have XYZ coordinates of atoms, nothing, nothing more. And, but, but however, the visualizer, the program, can make use of these coordinates in different ways. We can generate from, given those coordinates, we can generate a structure like this. I, after identifying helices, we can just insert in that region this cartoon model of a helix. Uh, and as you can see, these sheets, although they look, these, these sheets, I told you that they are straight, but there may, uh, we may observe certain bending in, even in these sheets, but it's a really complicated uh, set of uh, beta, uh, beta sheet here. Uh, lots of partners, uh, lots of strands involved. And this one contains mostly helices. And this is uh, another representation. And finally, I want to show you uh, another one if we have any. Yeah, carton only, trace only. The, the, this one just shows the, again, trace instead of using the, it's, it, it, gives, it, uses, it shows different colors to different secondary structures. And the final thing we have is wireframe. Yeah, and <laughs> this, uh, it looks very dark, but it show, just shows the bonds again between atoms uh, with thin lines. Okay, now let's continue. Uh, so I already talked about basics of proteins and the, and the length of protein. We have just seen one protein, which is composed of two chains, two amino acid chains, and they were, I guess, around 200 or amino acids long. Uh, actually, we can we can we can look at that if we have the PDB ID of this. Let me just check the PDB ID. Yeah, for example, uh, let's just look at another one. So this is another protein. Uh, maybe, maybe it was this one, right? Was it this protein that we were looking at? It looks similar, right? Some helices at top, uh, sheet site. I think it was this one. So let's see where we can download this it contains a lot of information about the protein structure the position summary is who deposited who found this structure and put it in protein databank so researchers who have found this structure they deposit this structure they upload it to protein databank using certain procedures uh, so the, it was in 1996 and it was modified in 2009 and some experimental details, it was found using X-ray uh, crystallography. And the resolution tells us how accurate the atomic coordinates are. And there are other uh, information that I don't know the meaning of them, actually. And there are external uh, annotations about function, taxonomy. And here on the left, we should be able to download the structure. 3D similarity, sequence, annotation, geometry. Yeah, download files. So PDB file. If we download the PDB file, let me open it with a WordPad. Okay, this is how a PDB file looks like. It's a text, this is a text file. It has a header, uh, it's a, the, lots of information. And the main data uh, is this. The main data looks like this. For each atom, we have a line which tells us which amino acid, uh, this, this is the uh, GLN is the amino acid name. I think it's glycine, but I'm not sure. Or glutamine, I don't, glu it's glutamine. So GLN is glutamine. 
uh, and the, uh, this atom, this nitrogen atom, belongs to this amino acid, which is the third amino acid in this sequence, amino acid sequence. So it starts from here, one, two, three. So here, uh, as we, we see the levels, this is the, this is the second. It starts from the second amino acid in change, valine, uh, and it has the coordinates of these atoms: nitrogen, alpha carbon carbon, oxygen, beta carbon, and these are also carbon atoms, two more carbon atoms. So these, for an amino acid, we have this many atoms in this PDB file. So it doesn't uh, have information about uh, hydrogen atoms, for example. Hydrogen atoms, uh, which are uh, part of the am amino acid in reality, are, their coordinates are missing. Uh, from this uh, file, but they can be generated by knowing the coordinates of these uh, important atoms. We can uh, construct uh, where the, we can predict where the hydrogen atoms are going to be in, in high accuracy. And each, as you can see, each amino acid have a number of atoms. The, and here, this is another serine amino acid. So it's uh, for and this for this for this atom, what we have is these three numbers, which are most important, x, y, z coordinates. It's their coordinates, coordinates of this atom in three-dimensional space. So we can, by using these coordinates, as you can see, it's uh, thousands of, it may contain thousands of atoms. <laughs> I'm going down. These are all the atoms that this, this, this protein contains. And by processing uh, these atoms, you can either visualize them in balls and sticks mode, uh, Van der Waals mode, uh, or cartoon mode. You can generate those cartoon images from these, uh, for these proteins. This and protein structure visualization tools are about this. These visualization tools give you a way to visualize these text files as three-dimensional shapes. And this is the, these, are, these were the atom coordinates that we had. So this is nitrogen, carbon, al al alpha carbon, the carbon, and uh, we have other carbon atoms in the side chain. So this is, uh, this is the common structure of an, each amino acid contains the same common structure. This nitrogen, alpha carbon, and this carbon are, these are these three uh, atoms are central, uh, are common in all amino acids, and the binding occurs uh, on the binding, the amino acid chain, uh, their binding to each other occurs among these uh, amino acids, this nitrogen and this carbon. For example, the next nitrogen of the amino acid, this, this I, I think I have a picture of that as well, yeah. So this is one amino acid, this is another amino acid, uh, they bind to each other, they form this sequence, but, but this carbon here binds to this nitrogen of the next amino acid, and they form this strong uh, chain. And these bonds are flexible, I'm meaning that they can turn. That's why this uh, protein structure may have much, many different shapes, based on how you turn this bond in between two connections. Imagine uh, you have yourself uh, like a, a toy uh, which, uh, which you can bend at, at a certain angle uh, between each connection. You can uh, make many, many different structures by playing with this, uh, and this is what happens in proteins. If we just had, imagine we just had three discrete angles that we could have between a bond. If we have a protein of length 100 amino acids, Okay, imagine we have a protein sequence of uh, 100 amino acids. And between each connection, you have a chance to choose from three different angles. Actually, this, in, in reality, this is not discrete. You can have much, much more different angular uh, flexibility. But just assume you have just three choices. It, it either 30 degrees, 45 degrees, or 60 degrees. H how many different structures you can get by <laughs> having this? It's, Three to the hundred, okay? Three to the power hundred different structures you can get, and it's a very, very, very large number. Three to the hundred is a very big number. Uh, so it means that the structural space is really huge. Determining from sequence the, the structure, that's why it's difficult. Your search space is very huge. Uh, so it's exhaustive search is impossible. 
So I told, I'm, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm not going to talk about these uh, uh, chem chemistry of the uh, amino acids, so basic measurements. I'm going to skip these parts. But I guess you understood how the connection of the amino acids occur. So these bonds between atoms have fixed lengths. This carbon alpha and this carbon, the bond length between them is 1.51 angstroms. And that's, that's fixed. I mean, the lengths are fixed, but the rotation, uh, we have flexibility, which gives uh, us, uh, which gives us a way uh, to have different protein structures. This angle, bond angle, it may range from 100 uh, degrees to 180 degrees. And there are also dihed dihedral angles, uh, which uh, compose, mm, uh, which is a, function of four atoms. And these rotations may tell us how uh, the protein structure, uh, by looking at these angles, we can tell certain things about whether we have a helix there, we have a sheet there. By looking at these bond angles between uh, consecutive uh, amino acids, we can tell something about the local structure of this protein. And there is a plot called Ramachandran plot, which is very common, which uh, plots the uh, angles between three consecutive amino acids. So two consecutive amino acids, their angles form a plane and uh, they, they have this uh, phi and psi angles uh, which, uh, which are measured how much uh, you deviate from that plane. Okay, these are like torsion angles to uh, two amino acids, their, whatever angle they have between them, they lay on a plane. And the third amino acid here its rotation is going to tell us how much you deviate from this plane of two amino acids. And you can measure uh, this angle in, by using different atoms. And it can tell you, okay, we have, right now, as you can see, we have three amino acids here. By this, one of them is this, carbon, alpha, and C. The other is this, carbon, alpha, and C. And this is the third one, carbon, alpha, and C. And these angles, uh, if you measure these angles, you can get these plots, which is going to tell you something about that uh, local structure. And I also mentioned about different levels of protein structures, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Primary structure was a sequence. Secondary structure is a local shape, whether it's going to be a helix or a beta sheet. Uh, there are the alpha helix is the most common one. So there you can observe different helix types. For example, helices, how many amino acids uh, per turn are, so a helix starts from a certain place, it makes a turn, comes back to the same uh, place. So how many amino acids are there in this turn? Uh, based on, uh, there are different types of helices uh, based on how many amino acids per turn are uh, observed. Uh, and the, I mean, the helical angle, and the most common of them is the alpha helix. I'm not going to talk about the other one. There's the beta sheet is formed between multiple beta strands. They look like straight like this. There are two types of beta sheets, um, but I, again, it's not very important for our purposes right now. I'm going to, you can read them on the slides later. So this one, as you can see, the beta sheets uh, since the protein sequence has a direction, okay, the protein sequence has a direction from uh, N-terminus to C-terminus, which means that if I have a beta strand in the middle here, it also has a direction, okay? If this was N-terminus and this was C-terminus, a subsequence here, uh, which is a beta sheet, is going to have a direction from here to here. I mean, the sequence tells me this uh, direction. And these arrows, shows those directions. If I have a beta sheet, be, beta strand here, and if I have another beta strand here, if they interact with each other like this, what do you observe is that, the, if you look at the order, this one was pointing this way, and this one is pointing this way. So they're pointing in different ways, okay? One of them is pointing, the, the one below here, the one below is pointing this way, in the sequence order, and the one above is pointing this way. If, they, if, if we have two beta, a beta sheet formed in this way, uh, it's called uh, anti-parallel uh, beta sheet. And here, 
uh, for example, these two beta strands, they form an anti-parallel one. But it's also possible that uh, we may have two beta strands showing the same direction uh, come and interact with each other. So how, how is that possible? How can you make such a thing with this? So uh, this one is going from this way to this way. So what you need to do is you need to, uh, for example, this beta sheet here, you need to make it uh, like this without changing its order. As you can see, I can have a beta sheet uh, which is pointing the same way, okay? Both of them, just look at this. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, without changing their order, they can, I can make them interact with each other. Both of them are uh, showing uh, this direction. Or it could be the reverse way. I mean, you, you can do uh, both things because what you have is really foldable, I mean, it's really flexible. You can do a lot of many different things with this protein structure. So we can observe these parallel beta sheets and these are really, and this is a snapshot from a really uh, high quality uh, picture producing uh, tool. Uh, this tool is called PyMol. Uh, they can, I mean, as you can see, there are shadows. <laughs> these uh, beta sheets cast shadows on these helices. You don't see these shadows in real proteins. <laughs> I mean, they're not exposed to sun or anything. I mean, but they, 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 are, they look nice. I mean, <laughs> the shadows, these high quality graphics, uh, 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 will help you to understand the three-dimensional relationship between individual elements. And this is another protein. As you can see, the shapes can be quite different. Look at this protein and look at this protein. They, the shapes are really different. That's this variety makes these functional diversity and uh, similar understanding similar structural proteins is therefore really important. There are other loops and turns and tertiary structures, the overall uh, shape and quaternary structure is the composition of multiple amino acid chains to form a large uh, structure. Here's a here's one quaternary structure between the interaction of two uh, amino acid chains and as you can see they're identical. The shapes here they're identical shapes two uh, protein chains of same sequence uh, uh, and if, if, if they're identical, they're called homodimer. If they are different amino acid chains, they are called heterodimer here. Uh, if, since this is a dimer, uh, it's composed of two chains. We have tetramer here. They may, they may be forming a quaternary structure like this, or maybe I could have put these two on top of these two to have a different quaternary structure. For example, this, I think this is hemoglobin. Uh, the pink ones are, uh, maybe, I don't know which one is alpha, which one is beta, but two identical pairs of uh, chains, four of them interact with each other to form this larger protein structure. And this is, we already looked at the PDB file, and these are the information about atom and amino acid and the XYZ coordinates uh, of an atom. And Let's have a break here for 10 minutes and we are going to continue uh, with the first problem. I think we are going to talk about structure prediction starting from secondary structure prediction. We are going to talk about how we can predict this three-dimensional shape from just the sequence information.